Madam Speaker, Therese Terlai, Chief Justice Philip Carbolito, Delegate Michael Sinicholas, members of the 36th Guam Legislature, Diplomatic Corps, former Governor Joe Ada, ROPA Benjamin Cruz, Mayor Jesse Alec, mayors and vice mayors, members of the Diplomatic Corps, my first gentleman, Jeff Cook, distinguished guests, family, friends, and all those tuning in virtually, including our Lieutenant Governor, Josh Tenorio. I come here tonight to address the honorable members of the House and to speak directly to the people who sent us here. When I first addressed you three years ago, I fully understood the job you elected Josh and me to do. For too long, leaders from both parties had perpetuated an era that valued short-term popularity over long-term solutions, a time that failed to look beyond the next paycheck or the next election. And so, predictably, our government's deficit exploded and tough decisions were left for some other day. But our people demanded change, and they trusted us to deliver. In the face of immense challenge, the government's deficit is gone. Tax refunds are being paid in weeks, not months. And none of this was achieved by leaving more debt to our children. Madam Speaker, I know it's tempting to believe these accomplishments were inevitable, but two years ago, we were confronted by the greatest global crisis in our post-war history. And no one in this room or within the sound of my voice needs a long list of statistics to remind us of what we lost. While healthcare systems around the world collapsed, Josh and I made hard choices. We acted decisively, knowing that the right decisions wouldn't always be the most popular ones. Our goal was simply to save as many lives as possible. Now, because of our healthcare professionals, first responders, and the Guam National Guard, an incredible 97% of you are vaccinated. Thanks to the hard work of public sector employees, we pushed out millions of dollars in local and federal aid, and we built an unemployment system in record time. Because of businesses that improvise, cared for their employees, and found new and creative ways to keep going because families adapted, because parents worked from home, kids learned online, and because our people never gave up. Madam Speaker, I am proud to report our island is fighting its way forward and getting stronger every day. we live in a time of sound bites and cynicism, and that too often the scope of our challenges is outmatched only by the anger of our politics. But I also understand that Democrat, Republican, or somewhere in between, we all care about the same things, a paycheck that keeps up with the cost of living, safer streets, schools that teach our children well, businesses that thrive, good health care, and a government that works for all of Guam. Madam Speaker, as we step 
out of COVID's long shadow, I submitted a budget to you, driven by fiscal responsibility and hope in our future. This budget recognizes right as well as reality, acknowledging that our general fund revenue collections have repeatedly exceeded our conservative estimates. Because of that, we ask this body to invest in the struggling and the disabled, the fight against violent crime and drugs, the work of healing the sick, nurturing our children, and unleashing the raw power of our economic creativity. Tonight, I am going to talk about how, working together, we can accomplish these goals and make life better for you and your families. We all see prices climbing at the gas station and the grocery store. From utilities to healthcare, childcare and housing, these increasing costs are shrinking family incomes faster than they can be earned. I cannot lower the market price of oil or solve the national inflation problem, but I can do everything in my power as governor to help you and your family through this time. First, our plan involves helping you meet the rising cost of living, starting with the power in your homes. Madam Speaker, GPA tells us that, the, that its fuel costs spike because of a world on the edge of conflict, not COVID-19. For that reason, federal law does not allow me to use pandemic funds to combat a non-COVID related emergency. But thankfully, because our government eliminated its general fund deficit and spent less than it collected in each of the last three years, we have the local funds to give our people relief. Working with Senator Joe Augustine and the Committee on Appropriations, we are proposing that every residential rate payer on Guam receive a monthly credit of $100 to immediately offset the cost of power for each of the next five months. <laughs> this $500 benefit will help alleviate your rising power bills. Send me a bill authorizing this credit, and I will sign it. <laughs> Just as I signed Bill 295 yesterday, waiving gas taxes for the next six months, almost immediately prices at the pump dropped as much as 19 cents a gallon. Senators. This is proof that when we come together for the good of our people, we can address the needs in meaningful, effective ways. It is what they hired us to do. Still, no one in this chamber can rest easy. We live in an uncertain world and the price of crude oil remains volatile. This is why we are working with GPA to lower your power bills going forward. To achieve this, 21st century technology must change a 20th century mindset. Right now, GPA has special batteries in two locations that store energy during low demand peaks and push that energy back out as demand peaks. This increases our capacity and saves on fuel costs. As I speak, more than 2,000 homes island-wide are using solar panels to produce their own energy and send excess capacity back to our grid. Additionally, GPA has one solar farm that has been in operation for several years and a new solar farm that just went online. Together, these two farms produce enough low-cost energy to power nearly 15,000 homes. 
and a third solar farm is scheduled for completion in two years. These 21st century goals will help us meet the threat of exploding energy costs and make us less vulnerable to them. And that means lower power costs for everyone. Second, we are going to put more money directly into the hands of those still struggling to make ends meet. We are extending our program in Salapi to give each person that qualifies $500 in new aid. <laughs> If you qualified for round two of Programa in Salapi, you don't have to do anything. You will automatically get a $500 check in the same manner. Those who did not apply for round two can still get this $500 by applying for Programa in Salapi three. And to support working families even more, we are helping you meet the rising cost of childcare. That is why we established Programa Pinilan. At nearly $100 million, it stands as the single largest childcare investment in Guam's history. This innovative program covers up to $675 a month per child in childcare costs for families and single parents. <laughs> if past programs disqualified you because you made just a little too much, we heard you. We increased the income threshold for working families by 300%. So those who never qualified before can finally get the help they need. First responders, you automatically qualify for this benefit. Five hundred children were supported by the initial rollout of this program. And we won't stop there. If you are a nana or an auntie who cares for the children after school or someone that looks after the little ones so others can keep a job, your work has value and Programa Pnilen will pay you for it. Right now, I know every dollar matters and every little bit helps. And I know many of you have better places to spend your money than on trash. That is why I am working with the Guam Solid Waste Authority to fund free trash collection for every household struggling under the weight of the pandemic, combined with a significant investment in capital equipment. These measures will serve as the foundation for free trash collection throughout the island. This $12 million investment is good for our people, good for our economy, and good for our environment. By addressing the rising cost of power, putting cash in your pockets, and paying for the cost of childcare and trash pickup so you don't have to, the first part of our plan places a floor under the challenges you face. Second, our plan establishes the foundation of a Guam that is stronger and more prosperous going forward. COVID taught us that too often families are forced to choose between the health of those they love and the wages they need to live. 
That must end with us. Let me be clear. I support paid sick and family leave for everyone who works. To place us on that path tonight, I call on every member of this chamber to develop policies that set the foundation for paid family leave throughout the private sector. If you are a business that shares our values, that believes in your employees, our vital assets worthy of investments, our government should incentivize that belief with breaks on business licensing and competitive procurement policies. Josh and I know that although programs can help, most people want the dignity of a decent job. While the pain of COVID is still felt by too many, Guam's economy is finally rebounding. Every day, I see proof that the spark of entrepreneurship still lives in the hearts of our people. Small businesses is stirring again. Storefronts are open once more and a tidal wave of federal and local investment are poised to lift this island up and restore prosperity for everyone willing to work for it. Consider this. The US military has committed to spending $12 billion on our island in the coming years, but just $3 billion has been spent thus far. Our task is to be ready for this new era of growth at our door. The governor's island-wide job fair is happening July 1st with over 500 private sector jobs available. I encourage those looking for new opportunities to attend and to take advantage of our American Job Center Employment Readiness Assistance. In the short term, the Guam Registered Apprenticeship Program is straining our fellow citizens to capture the skilled labor jobs already in high demand today. From cybersecurity to construction, HVAC, truck driving, and welding to electrical and plumbing, medical billing, telecom, and more, Guam leads the nation in skilled apprenticeships per capita a trend we have continued for the last two years. Increased defense spending also means our people will have the opportunity to train for jobs like 3D printing and drone operation. From day one, Josh and I have worked to build partnerships at every level of the federal government, working closely with Admiral Aquilino at Indopaycom Admiral Nicholson of Joint Region Marianas Guam and other officials has been essential to our success in increasing federal spending, leveraging federal COVID resources, securing more skilled labor, and being respected in the halls of national power. It also helps when you do the right thing, despite what it might cost politically. By stepping up to help the sailors of the USS Theodore Roosevelt, by providing them safe harbor, we demonstrated our island's patriotism and our spirit of inafa malik to federal officials and members of Congress. They are now working with us to address Guam's needs, whereas before, Many of them couldn't even find us on a map. Of course, no economic recovery can be significant without the full return of our tourism industry. I can report to you tonight, tourism is coming back strong. Our arrival numbers were up nearly 360% compared to May of last year. 
and June is looking even better. But the evidence is in more than the numbers. Tumon is alive with visitors again. Airline carrier, carriers are adding new inbound flights. Hiring has increased, and the embers of new hope are glowing. Our task is to build on this foundation, expanding the circle of prosperity so no one is left behind. Through the work of the private sector to revitalize our destination, we are poised to reap the benefits of a tourism resurgence that is just now beginning to hit our shores. And with the unyielding energy of former Governor Carl Guterres, Board Chair Milton Murriaga, and the men and women of GVB are letting the world know once again that Guam is where America's day begins and we are open for business. <laughs> jobs and better pay for our people. But strengthening tourism is about more than Tumon Bay. Thanks to our $15 million ARP investment in the construction of Hotel Wharf at the port, our island will finally see the birth of Guam's cruise ship industry, bringing with it the potential of thousands of new tourists and hundreds of new jobs. This multi-million dollar economic investment will also be good in the short term. We made this investment on the condition that the port will not increase tariffs for the next two fiscal years, helping to avoid an increase in the price of goods we ship here. But if history has taught us anything, it is that no economy is immune to the world's uncertainties. That's why our private sector economic diversification group is working to bring to our shores new industries that create sustainable jobs for our people. In partnership with Vice Speaker Tina Munya Barnes, we are shoring up our transshipment capabilities. This makes us a more competitive destination for light manufacturing investment, brings down the cost of construction, and creates skilled jobs. Moreover, new undersea cables installed off of our shores are literally laying the groundwork for a Guam technology ecosystem. Whether it is data centers, app or game development or bridging regional entrepreneurs and, in, and in innovators, these cables give us a competitive advantage. And they have gotten the attention of the Googles and the Amazons of the world. But no plan of economic diversification can succeed without an educated workforce. And no workforce can be educated without good teachers. This is why we implemented a 20% pay raise for our educators. They help shape the, the minds and mold the character of our precious resources, our children. For that, our teachers are worth every dollar of this increase. We are also investing millions in school maintenance and facilities. Moreover, we are keeping our commitment to begin construction of the new Simon Sanchez campus before the end of the year. And yet, today's educational environment is about more than the four walls of a classroom. We know that this generation is already operating in two realities. 
one on island and one online. Yet, the U.S. Department of Commerce reports that 32% of Guam residents live in an area with no broadband infrastructure and nearly 20% of households do not subscribe to an internet provider. Thanks to recently awarded federal broadband grants, 10,000 Guam households will now have improved access to broadband. But this is not enough. Tonight, I ask every member of this chamber to join me in the work of securing universal basic internet access for all. Whether through federal or local funds or some mix of both, we must do this so everyone has the opportunity to succeed just, not just on Guam, but in the metaverse. these commitments will matter if it becomes harder to keep a roof over your family's head. That is why we help nearly 700 families with emergency rental assistance. It is also why we have invested over 13 million dollars in our housing assistance program and put nearly 70 million toward making rental units affordable for our local people. We are also applying for federal funding to build more affordable homes and to install infrastructure on Chamorro Land Trust properties. And thanks to the work of the late Gura, Administrator Ray Taposhnia, we will be pursuing the federal mortgage tax credit program. This will allow working families to offset down payments or closing costs making more homes much more affordable for our people. Lowering the cost of housing demands that we increase our housing inventory. That requires immediate access to skilled labor. Let me be clear. It is thanks to our administration's hard work with both the Trump and Biden White Houses, the US Department of Labor, the Department of Defense and Congress that Guam has acquired more skilled foreign labor now than at any other period in recent history. But even more is needed because as we know, the buildup is affecting the cost of labor outside the fence. I have asked our partners in US Citizenship and Immigration Services, DOD and Congress to authorize H2B program rules that allow us to speed up the sourcing of foreign labor to meet our local needs, especially for construction of more affordable housing. In the meantime, our Guam Department of Labor can now certify on its own the need for skilled labor outside the fence, allowing us to directly address local demand. Like housing, I know that the rising cost of health care keeps many up at night. That is why we must boldly rethink old models and deliver on the work we started early in our administration. Health insurance, not just for the lucky or the few, but as a human right. The first step toward universal health care program for Guam will be lowering the cost of GovQuam Health Insurance, a program that covers 13,000 employees, retirees, and their children. By covering the cost of care ourselves and administering it privately with our existing insurers, we believe we can cut costs, cancel healthcare bureaucracies, and cover more people. Once this model is proven, it will be expanded to businesses increasing coverage where none presently exists. Surely we have learned that our economy cannot be healthy if our people are sick. For this reason, lowering the cost of preventive health care is more than a moral obligation. It is an economic mandate.
We must also admit that our healthcare needs have grown beyond Guam Memorial Hospital's physical ability to meet them. We have two choices. We can force yet another generation of our people to seek care thousands of miles away, or we can act now. Senators, my choice is very clear. A healthcare delivery complex that includes a new hospital, public health facility, behavioral health center, and a veterans health clinic. Our people deserve nothing less. working to protect Guam's families in other ways. Long before the struggles of the last two years, I announced our Safer Guam initiative, a plan to increase the number of police officers patrolling our streets, prevent drugs from entering our borders, and end the revolving door of crime. Senators, this plan was necessary then, and it's even more necessary now. My proposals were simple and they were common sense. End parole for those who commit crimes involving sex and violence. Stop plea agreements until every judge has heard from the victims of crime or their families. No exceptions. Limit the late night off-premise sale of alcohol. Hold parents accountable for the crimes of their children. Senators, we need action on these proposals. I believe they will help, but laws alone are never enough. Too many law enforcement officers receive their training and experience from GovGuam only to leave for better paying jobs in another branch or the federal service. That is why our administration issued the largest pay increase for law enforcement in seven years. And why we've increased the number of police officers by 70 since we came into office. The largest number of police recruits hired in decades. We all know that crime thrives in the dark. That is why we are also installing 2,000 LED streetlights throughout our island. And tonight, I also want to recognize the residents of Guam's neighborhood watches. In a time of Facebook posts and WhatsApp forwards, your quick action on your cell phones are helping our police officers catch criminals and protect our families. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ensuring public safety demands that we address the root cause of crime. So much of the crime we see is driven by the tragedy of addiction. In the last three years alone, we seize nearly 400 pounds of crystal methamphetamine, the largest rate of drug seizures during any three-year period in recent history. We've tightened our borders, increased the number of drug-sniffing dogs, and added more officers to the fight. But every advance we make is matched by a committed enemy, those who profit of the misery of others. To meaningfully deter crime, we must acknowledge that cutting supply will only work if we decrease demand. And because we know that treatment is always better than prison sentences, the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center is investing over $17 million to fight addiction at the source. $7.5 million is going to the New Beginnings facility and nearly 700,000 to renovate the Talafofu cottage homes. The rest, nearly $9 million, will go into treatment programs to help our people beat this demon. 
And as promised, the Salvation Army's new Guma Famalatwan Treatment Center for Mothers will be opening early next year. In addition, Project U partners our police officers with at-risk young people to arm them with goals, opportunity, and hope for a better future. Guam is at its best when we come together as one people for the betterment of all. Nowhere is that more important than in raising our children well. It does take a village to raise a child, but that work begins in our homes. I ask every person who loves Guam and hopes to see it better to commit to the cause of being an example to our children. Instill in them a sense of pride in being constructive, positive members of our community. As we work, as we work to address the challenges facing our community, whether it's securing savings for your household, helping you cover the cost of childcare, delivering more direct aid, or creating new opportunities for you to thrive. We must also keep the sacred promise every free citizen makes to those who serve. If you sacrifice for us abroad, we will care for you at home. At the recommendation of Lieutenant Governor Josh, a dozen beds will be dedicated to the care of Guam's veterans at our current long-term care facility in Barragata Heights until we complete the veteran center of our new hospital. Josh also met with officials in D.C. last week, working to establish the Veterans Center in Hagatnya, digitize veterans' records, and recruit and train volunteers to be certified veterans service officers. Together, we take these steps forward, knowing we must do more for those who stood on the Watchtower of Freedom. Tonight, I remember one veteran in particular, Gold Star Father Anthony Guzman Lukela, whose son, a U.S. Army Sergeant Joshua Lukela, was killed in Afghanistan. Mr. Lukela is here with us tonight. Mr. Lukela, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> This year's Memorial Day ceremony, Mr. Lukela reminded all of us that one of our greatest legacies is how we treat each other. He said, when considering all of our problems, we need to remember love, kindness, and respect for one another. That if we lose our better selves to anger and mistrust, to the petty and the small, we dishonor the sacrifices made on our behalf. Thank you, Mr. Lukela, for your words of wisdom. We hold to simple... <laughs> we hold to a simple truth. Some challenges may be too great for one person to handle alone, but no challenges is too great for Guam if we work together. Our stories are as different as our points of view, but we are bound together by a faith more powerful than any discord or division. Our love for family, our belief in our island's progress, and our relentless hope that the lives of our children will be better than our own. We are recovering, we are stronger, and together we will fight to keep Guam moving forward. God bless you 
and God bless Guam. upon the Reverend Father Juni Valencia to deliver the benediction. Please remain standing. Let us pray. Gracious and generous God, you have blessed us with many resources to serve you and our people. We praise and thank you for these gifts, and we ask that you show us how to best use them. As we go forth from this place, we ask that you bless our governor and leaders with wisdom, strength, and compassion, that they may be effective leaders for the people of Guam. Finally, we ask your blessing upon all of us gathered here, as well as the people and island of Guam, that with your blessing, we may work together in love and unity to build a more just society, a more effective government. You are the Prince of Peace, and we ask for this peace which only you can give upon our families, our communities, and our island home. We ask all these things through the intercession of our island's patroness and protectress, Santa Maria Camelin. Through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Please be seated. Majority Leader, Senator Nelson, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to rise from the Committee of the Whole and to adjourn session subject to the call of the Speaker. On that motion to rise from the Committee of the Whole and adjourn, is there any objection? Seeing no And objection, once again, you are looking live at a feed courtesy of our friends at the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel of the Governor's 2022 State of the Island Address, a absolutely stirring address delivered by our beloved Magahaga, the Commander-in-Chief and the Chief Executive of the government of Guam, Lu Leon Guerrero. Um, she seemed to be very, very enthusiastic in presenting um, a speech that, that was uh, filled with, a, um, with an air of optimism. She was recapping some of the many achievements that her administration has done, also covering a litany of topics. And we want to give you some of the highlights, some of the, um, the touch points, if you will, of some of the major, um, uh, the major themes addressed by the governor in her speech just delivered this evening. Once again, you're looking at the Guam Congress building live as uh, Vice Speaker uh, Talina Nelson has properly accepted the governor's speech and is now dismissing the members. Nestor Lacanto is standing by and we are going to have an interview with them, um, get some reactions from some of those members of leadership uh, who were present in person. But again, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the highlights and let's bring up the graphic to show you exactly what the governor touched on. Several of these themes met with a very, very positive response from those in the House. And right off the bat, she was talking about the cost of living, a monthly credit, of course, of $100, five months to offset island power bills. You know, of course, the price of fuel has gone way, way up. And of course, the governor did sign into public law a piece of legislation just yesterday making that now public policy to save the people of Guam a considerable amount of money. She also talked about the third installment of her program Salapi initiative, which is the extends the program giving $500 in new aid to the people of the territory. 
The governor was adding that if you qualify for round two of Programa Salapi, you don't have to do anything and you will automatically get a check of $500 in the same manner. If you did not apply for round two, you can still get the $500 by applying for Programa Salapi 3. Taking a look at what else the governor talked about, free trash collection. She is working with the Guam Solid Waste Authority, the agency that is responsible, of course, for trash pickup. She also said $12 million in investment towards this end is good for the people of Guam. Of course, trash collection has been a constant issue that many island residents wish would uh, be more streamlined, more consistent. So the governor is, of course, um, providing a lot more investment, as it says on the screen, towards that end. The all-important topic of education, of course, the superintendent of GDOE, John Fernandez, recently um, announcing his resignation. But she is saying in education, allowing for basic Internet access allows for student success. Absolutely agree with that. So providing online services to all Guam students, all the way from Jigo down to Humatic. So she was touching on the fact that she wants to give um, kids the ability to get online and, you know, um, get into more fields like STEM, science, engineering, science, technology, engineering, and math, of course. And universal health care, of course, was a major topic. Of course, we're coming out of the two and a half year coronavirus pandemic and into health care. She said it's not just for the lucky or for the few, but health care is a basic human right. The first step, she said, towards universal health care will be lowering the cost of GovGuam health insurance, covering some 13,000 employees, retirees, and their families. Governor Leon Guerrero also talked about housing and speaking of investment, she's saying she is putting aside some $13 million towards giving people a permanent place of residence, in-house assistance initiatives, and nearly $70 million in affordable rental units. Of course, there have been several programs during the pandemic era um, going towards helping people pay their rent and also um, helping people uh, from being evicted, also going to help landlords stay in business. Uh, the federal mortgage tax credit program was one of the initiatives that was outlined to make this happen, of course. Um, the governor then touched on the topic of public safety, where she said she would install some 2,000 street lights that are LED technology. Now, remember, LED lights, they last a lot longer. They use a lot less energy. Uh, very, very safe, very, very environmentally friendly. And she wants to put about 2,000 such devices throughout the island. Also, praising neighborhood watch and chat groups that are helping keeping the island safe. And she wants to make more of these um, community-oriented, um, community plans, if you will, uh, available to all island residents through mobile means, through technology, through consumer devices, uh, the, the supercomputers that you carry around in your hand every day. Governor Leon Gros said she wants all Guamanians to take stewardship of our island community um, and really help out those that wear the uniforms, such as GPD and also those in law enforcement. Um, I also want to touch on a couple of the points that the governor saved at the very end. You know, she touched on so many different themes in her in her speech, but saving um, the work of our beloved veterans uh, for the very last and also calling, of course, um, and asking to stand and be recognized um, the father uh, of the Gold Star family of U.S. Army Sergeant Joshua Lukiala. That was Anthony Guzman Lukiala, who uh, she did note spoke at Memorial Day. Um, and of course, everybody down at the Guam Congress building he gave him a very, very respectful uh, round of applause. Uh, he, of course, of the Gold Star family, his son, Josh, uh, U.S. Army Sergeant Joshua Lukiala was killed um, in Afghanistan. Uh, the governor also, really quick before we go back to Nestor Lacanto down, um, downtown, the governor also made reference to her running mate, Lieutenant Governor Josh Turner. Of course, he could not make it there. We reported uh, that he unfortunately has contracted uh, COVID for the second time. So, of course, our thoughts and prayers are with the, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, and we wish him a speedy recovery. But it was good to see um, leadership from both sides of the uh, of the hall there at the Guam Congress building, of course, echoing that statement. They wish the very best for the governor. The lieutenant governor, I should say. OK, now let's go back to the Guam Congress building, the aforementioned, where my broadcast partner, Nestor Lacanto, is standing by. And he has the minority leader of the 36th Guam legislature, Chris Duenas. Half a day, Ness. All right, thanks, Jace. Uh, we're here live from the Guam Congress building where uh, Governor Leon Guerrero has just completed about an hour-long uh, State of the Island address. And I'm here with uh, Minority Leader Chris Duenas. Uh, Senator is uh, the Minority Leader is representing the Republican Party. First of all, Senator, uh, your reaction to the speech? So um, I guess like many speeches, the devil will be in the details uh, with regard to many of the programs that were discussed and rolled out. 
I think one thing I want to be clear about, Nestor, is um, you know I, I can understand the temptation to take credit uh, for the current surpluses, but I have to say that the surpluses actually are a reflection of this legislature's conservative budgets. Another thing is, Nestor, is uh, the, the surpluses are always as, also as a result of the 5% GRT that currently exists. And um, one thing I was concerned about, um, of course, the $100 applied to uh, uh, power bills for five months, totaling $500. I did some quick math on 50,000 households. That'll be about $25 million uh, that the governor is asking the legislature to send her a bill for. So, Nestor, now we're talking about $25 million. We're talking about $35 million for the teachers' raises. We're talking about law enforcement raises that went into play, as well as most agencies that have come down to the legislature have anywhere between 5 to 20 percent increase in their budgets. You know, Nestor, I'm almost glad now that the speech is close to the budget session because I don't know, um, you know, if the math is going to add up by putting all that responsibility on the legislature and accounting for these surpluses. So it's going to be important uh, to go over that. One thing I'm curious about is the governor said that uh, she couldn't use ARP uh, to offset the, the power bills. But I thought that well, that was something that was used prior in terms of being able to defray the cost. So we'll have to look into that. Overall, um, you know, one of the positive areas in terms of economic diversification that actually came out of this legislature was the issue of the new cables coming into Guam. Uh, GTA, of course, is spearheading that. Uh, that was initiated from this legislature. I want to thank the speaker because what the speaker did also with working with the Republican minority and others was include the fact that there will be $100,000 per cable uh, in terms of what's coming in, and that money is going to go to Chamorro Land Trust. The reason why I bring that up, Nestor, is I understand the governor discussing the opportunities for closing costs and federal programs for affordable housing. That already exists at Guam Housing. The most important thing on Chamorro Land Trust that this legislature issued to the governor in our resolution in terms of spending ARP was $25 million for infrastructure for lands right now that already are ready for development under the Chamorro Land Trust. Unfortunately, that never went anywhere, and that's the fastest way to get affordable housing started on, on uh, Chamorro Land Trust properties. So if you look at a number of the programs, well, like I said, the devil will be in the details. Uh, but I just wish the governor would work more closely with this legislature because all of these funding priorities really have to be accounted for in the budget. So once again, I'm almost inclined to say we should maybe start moving this speech a little closer um, you know, to the budget season because a lot of the promises put forward will have to be realized through the budget. Uh, there was really no real plan laid out for the additional or the remaining $300 million. It was kind of a program here and a program there. You know, this legislature has required the governor to give us a monthly accounting. So we're going to see even in the coming weeks uh, in the next month's accounting for that money coming forward and how it's being spent. So those details are already provided to us. We'll see how that goes forward. So essentially, Senator, you're saying that uh, um, we may not be able to afford it. Uh, the latest uh, CRER, the Consolidated Revenue and Expense Report, says we're tracking at about $85 million. Uh, um, $85 million, that's about $2 million down from last month. Um, but is, you don't think at this point those particular programs, which I imagine will be popular with uh, the public, the $500 for sure. GPA and the Programa Salapi, uh, the third iteration, uh, those obviously will be popular with the public, but are you, are you saying that it's likely that you we won't be able to afford it from general fund revenues? Well, I'm saying that all the promises that have been made so far, and this is why I'm saying whenever you're going outside of the ARP, you know, it's the governor's proclamation is ARP money is to be spent by the governor's office, by the governor, by the executive. It's hands off from the legislature. Her proposal on that power agreement tonight is the general fund. Once again, going over the numbers just for this budget alone, the teacher pay, $35 million. This power um, um, you know, program by legislation from the general fund is $25 million was what my quick math came up to. We've got the law enforcement pay and we've got between 5 and 20% is what the agencies have been asking in excess. So I think we're going to have to have the budget chair immediately sit down and take all these monies into account simply because I don't think the math adds up at this point. Good program. But that's why it's so important to work for the with the legislature first before rolling out a program, especially with all the wish lists that's been coming in through the budget season. That's my concern. I don't want the people of Guam out there to get excited about a program that hasn't been vetted in terms of what monies are available in the general fund. All right, Senator, that's uh, Senator Chris Duanius, the minority leader of the Guam legislature. Thanks for joining us. Uh, back to you in this video, Jason.
All right, Nestor, thanks so much. I know Nestor's covered uh, many of these over the course of his uh, illustrious journalism career. This is certainly a very, very historic um, one. And of course, you know, the, go the governor herself, you know, she has worked over the course of her distinguished career for um, several uh, several decades now, of course, she is a registered nurse. So, of course, the time she spent discussing health care and, you know, and the and the empathy that she has for people in that uh, in that line of work. Obviously, the the most overwhelming um, ovation that was received when, of course, she said that for the third installment of the program in Salapi uh, program was that the uh, island's frontliners would would qualify for that. And, and, you know, that was met with universal praise from everybody again on both sides of the aisle. The governor, of course, a very successful business person. Um, she was ran a bank for several years, her family's business, you know, the Bank of Guam. And she talked about uh, the need to rebuild the economy. And she talked about making Guam um, a premier tourism destination. She talked about the importance of the Guam Visitors Bureau and how she wants to bring tourism back and, uh, you know, not just get us back on track, but really strive for a, a new era and a new level of excellence, um, unprecedented uh, going forward. And then, you know, of course, the, go the governor is a parent herself and she's a grandmother and she talked about, uh, about family values and, and the difficulties our people have, uh, have experienced over the course of, of these last two and a half years due to the pandemic and you know the, the cost of living and she said she is she is obviously aware and her heart obviously goes out to those people you know talking about from utilities health care child care services housing and talking about the increasing cost in all of those so um, certainly a speech you know some some 10 pages long when printed out but certainly many many themes that the governor covered uh, and we would like to know your thoughts. Um, looking at some comments on, on social media, Tomas Manglonia, our um, correspondent for, uh, for Matters, has been live tweeting. So you can go to our Twitter feed at uh, twitter.com slash KUM News and watch his reaction. But we want to know how, what you felt. Certainly not everybody is going to be on board with everything that the uh, chief executive said. There may be a, a lot of people who may have criticism or maybe felt that she didn't touch on certain topics uh, well enough. And we would like to hear your thoughts on that, too. So please, if you're watching us on YouTube, if you're watching us on um, on the Facebook live, you think I would remember that on Facebook um, or on the Twitter stream, please add your comments and we'll feature those um, on our shows tomorrow. So uh, a lot to cover. Um, the governor did go over a lot as we are heading towards the 8 o'clock hour. So we hope you enjoyed KUM's coverage of the 2022 State of the Island Address. It was brought to you, of course, by our friends down at the Guam Legislature on their wonderful YouTube feed. So congratulations to our friends, and we know them very well. We work with them all the time. So great job by their technical people. And congratulations to the governor. Um, these kind of things, obviously, uh, very, very tense. A lot of work goes into it. So congratulations, Gov, to your and your team on another um, state of the island address the first one of course that she has been able to deliver and you could kind of see some of the uh, the joy that she was able to uh, to interact with the various members of all three branches of the government of Guam being there delivering a very stirring address and with that ladies and gentlemen we are going to end our coverage of tonight's address so from all of us here at the KUM studios in Harmon I'm Jason Salas wishing you a good evening and good night